It's important to recognize that the acronym STEM, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics, includes engineering. And so we're going to spend some time looking at the characteristics of engineering and then the characteristics of engineering ethics. When you stop and think about it, no single profession impacts our lives more thoroughly than engineering. Everything from the cars we drive, to the roads that we drive them on, the buildings we inhabit, the electronic devices we use, whether they're cell phones, computers, and so on, even the water we drink. An engineer has had a hand in all of that. Yet, despite the ubiquity of engineering in our lives, it's not uncommon for people to know very little about engineering. In her book, Lessons Amid the Rubble, An Introduction to Post-Disaster Engineering, Sarah Fodiker defines engineering as design under constraint. And I think this is a very elegant way to describe engineering process and, and really differentiate it in many ways from, say, science. I want to discuss several characteristics of engineering, the first of which is complexity. Engineering is a complex undertaking. There's a misconception that engineering takes place in a technical vacuum, that engineers are sequestered in a laboratory and, and only interact with other engineers. But in fact, engineers design products and even services for real world applications. And in the process, engineers interact with a variety of stakeholders, whether it's with the general public, with their clients, who are sometimes separate than the general public, with accountants, purchasing managers, and their fellow engineers. A key part of Sarah Fodiker's definition is design under constraint, and constraint is very important to pay attention to. In a perfect world, engineers would be able to design and deploy products that are maximally safe, efficient, and effective. But in our world, and under real-life circumstances, this would be prohibitively expensive and time-intensive. Engineers must often balance quality considerations with time and financial constraints. A incredibly maximally safe car that is unaffordable to all but a very few is not a very good design. It doesn't very really benefit people. This balancing act between quality, time, and money requires a great deal of thoughtfulness and ethical fortitude. Another characteristic of engineering is that it's marked by tension. Tension between, say, competing interests. There are corporate or commercial interests. Oftentimes, engineers are working for companies that are profit-driven. Okay? Uh, things like market dominance and innovation really dominate uh, corporate mentality and, and strategy, and engineers have to be aware of this and deal with this. Engineers also have tension coming from a personal dimension whether it's through earning a, uh, a good salary or seeking out promotion opportunities. And finally, there are public interests that an engineer has to keep in mind. How will this design or product impact the public? How will it benefit the public? Will it hurt the public? And how should this be taken care of? Again, in a perfect world, corporate interests, personal interests, and public interests would perfectly align. But again, the reality is that they do not. And there's a, a tension then that engineers have to, to deal with, to, to navigate, to solve. There's also a tension between the costs and benefits of any technology. All technology, even the most beneficial, has a cost. There are no panaceas. So given the characteristics that I just discussed, it's clear then that ethics is an important part of engineering. But as it turns out, engineering ethics can also be complex. For example, there is the obligation uh, that every engineer has to uphold the safety, health, and welfare of the public, um, whether they find this in the National Society of Professional Engineers Code of Ethics, the American Society of Civil Engineers Code of Ethics, and so on. There is an obligation, again, to hold paramount the safety, health, and welfare of the public. Now, on the face of it, this looks very uncontroversial and straightforward, but with a little bit of digging, we'll see it's actually a fairly complex idea. For example, who's the public? Is it everyone? Is it just the people that are directly affected by a technology? How does this notion of public apply to the development of things like weapons, for example? Also, 
How do we define welfare? Do we simply mean physical welfare, our health for example? Do we mean psychological welfare, social welfare, spiritual welfare, even financial welfare? All of these different facets play into a fairly robust and complicated notion of, of welfare. And what we notice is, as we, as we look at those different facets, the nature of the obligation that engineers have, it changes. So as we can see, ethical issues are complicated in engineering. The important thing, the absolutely critical thing to keep in mind is that ethics is integral to the practice of engineering. It's not an afterthought. It's not a um, second to last step to be considered. Rather, ethical considerations are integrated throughout the engineering process from inception to completion. It's also important to recognize that engineers imprint their values on virtually everything they do. Even something as simple as specifying the height of a bridge can have ethical ramifications. This is actually an example that Sarah Fodiker uses in her book, Lessons Amid the Rubble. If a bridge, for example, is designed too low or at a certain height to save money on, say, materials and time on construction, if that bridge is too low to allow public transportation such as buses to pass underneath it, then the people that regularly ride the buses are negatively or adversely affected by what appeared to be initially a simple technical decision. Thankfully, th there are sources of guidance that engineers can refer to. Engineering is considered a profession essentially in the same way that uh, law and medicine is. And as a result, there are codes of ethics that apply to engineers' conduct. Some examples include the code of ethics that comes from the American Society of Civil Engineers, or ASCE, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, or ASME, and the Society of Petroleum Engineers, SPE. For those that are interested, these codes are easily accessible by doing a simple internet search for the engineering society and then just searching for code of ethics within that uh, society's website. And there's also third-party sources of information such as the um, study for uh, ethics in the, uh, the center, excuse me, for the study of ethics in the professions at Illinois Institute of Technology. What we notice in the codes of ethics is that they talk about obligations. They talk about an engineer's obligation, certainly to the public, but also to their clients and even to their fellow engineers. Engineers have a responsibility and obligation to their profession. Some codes also have what we call an aspirational dimension. They emphasize the opportunities for self and community development that engineers have, and I think this is very important. When we're talking about ethics and, and engineering, it's important to recognize that it's not all about obligations. It's not all about what you should or can or can't do. It's also about what you have an opportunity to do. And when we're talking about engineering to our students in a K through 12 setting, it's important to emphasize these opportunities because it can really awaken, awaken an interest in engineering amongst our students. Arguably, there are three general ideas that underwrite the code of ethics. The first is what we call the principle of utility, and that is simply stated that the right thing to do, in fact what we have an obligation to do, is to promote the greatest good for the greatest number of people. Another principle that's very common in the codes of ethics and really informs the code of ethics is what we call the principle of respect. And the principle of respect states that people should be treated as ends in themselves and not as mere means to an end. Now it's important to recognize there that the word mere does a lot of work. I can go to my physician and treat my physician as a means to an end for better health or my mechanic as a means to an end to fix my car. The important point is that I don't simply view that person or value that person in virtue of what they do for me. Okay, I have to treat them, I have an obligation to treat them, I ought to treat them as an end in themselves. Finally, the third idea that really informs the engineering code of ethics is an approach called virtue ethics. And on, on this approach, right and wrong is not simply about following certain actions or rules. It's about being the right kind of person. On this approach, we should cultivate virtues such as honesty, compassion, courage, and temperance. 
Now, what we're looking at is how to incorporate ethics into, into STEM and into a PBL context specifically. We suggest that it can be very helpful to refer to these codes of ethics and these general ideas that I talked about when discussing ethics in a PBL context. You can introduce a series of questions and discussion among students and then introduce sources of guidance that might provide some answers to those questions that you've introduced. And as it turns out, using these codes of ethics or these three general ideas can actually help us identify issues to begin with. So in other words, these codes and principles don't only, um, they, they don't just stand to improve our reasoning, but they can help increase our sensitivity as well by helping us to see and identify issues that we might not have previously been paying attention to. Thank you.